main speaker, come on up, Labrata. And uh, ask her all the questions you want. She's uh, got all the answers. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> My first question for you is, did everybody get this handout? Starts out with useful phone numbers and websites. If you don't have one, they're on the back corner right next to the video camera. And it's a whole stack of paper because I secretly own stock in a paper mill, and so I just grind it out. All kinds of information about Medicare. You're always interested in Medicare, but especially this time of year, because we're in the enrollment period. It began the 7th of October last week, and it runs until December 7th. And that is your opportunity to review your... You got another one? Back there. Oh. To review your Part D plan, your drug plan, or your Medicare Advantage plan. See what that plan is offering for next year, and decide whether you want to stick with that one or make a switch. And if you make a switch during that time, from now until December 7th, it will take effect the 1st of January. This is your opportunity. What's at stake? Your health and your money. So it's worth paying attention to. First look at page two of your handout. And it gives you all kinds of important numbers historically since 2006. The Medicare Part B premium, that's the amount that's probably taken out of your Social Security check every month. And that is currently $104.90. It's line page two, page two, horizontal. No, but it's page two. You can count to two. The Part B premium, $104.90 this year, and the good news is it's the same amount next year. It's not going up. But your Social Security will go up. I just read in the Tribune this morning that the cost of living adjustment is going to be 1.7%. <laughs> well, it's not a big deal, but if you lost 1.7%, you would think it was a big deal. So think positive. And because the Part B premium is not going up, you'll get to keep the whole 1.7%. You won't have a big chunk of it diverted to pay the increase in Part B. So the average is going to be about 22 to 24 dollars for most people but of course it depends on what you're getting now the part b deductible is also not going up it's staying the same at 147 dollars the first 147 dollars that you incur in health care costs covered by medicare are your responsibility after that then the medicare uh, program starts paying its share, which in most cases is 80%. So that's good. Very few people pay the Part A premium because you earned what's called premium free Part A by paying the payroll tax, you or your spouse, during your working lifetime, so you get A free. But if you didn't do that, then the premium is $407 a month. So be glad you're not paying that. The Part A deductible is what you pay if you are admitted to the hospital. If you just go in for outpatient care, such as tests, or you have to go in to have stitches in the emergency room, something like that, you're not admitted, you don't pay the Part A deductible. But if you are admitted, then it's $1,260. It's currently $1,216. Next year, it'll be $1,260. That is not an annual deductible. That is per benefit period. A benefit period begins on the day you are admitted to the hospital and lasts until you have been discharged. And if you need skilled care after the hospital stay, discharge from that, and you have been home for 60 days. 
if after those 60 days you go back to the hospital and you are admitted again, that's a second benefit period and you pay the deductible a second time. If you go back a third time after that 60 days at home, you pay the deductible the third time. It's mathematically possible to do it five times in the course of a year. It doesn't happen very often, but it could. But of course, you also could be, never pay it because you never were admitted to the hospital. But just keep in mind that's not an annual thing, it is per benefit period. On the subject of being admitted to the hospital, I want to inject another reminder, which is if you do go to the hospital, pay attention to whether or not you are being admitted as an inpatient or whether you are there for observation. Now obviously if you just go in and have a test and you go home the same day, this isn't an issue. But if you stay overnight and you're in a hospital bed, you think you're admitted, not necessarily. Suppose, for instance, you go to the hospital ER and you're having chest pains and you're afraid it's a heart attack. So they do whatever preliminary work is necessary and then they say, we want to keep you for observation. So they send you upstairs and you're in a hospital bed in one of those unflattering hospital gowns. You think you're in the hospital, but you are not an admitted patient. Therefore, you don't pay that Part A deductible but you will be billed kind of on an a la carte basis for every service that you receive because your outpatient is Part B. Furthermore, if you're not admitted, Medicare Part A will not cover a skilled nursing facility stay if you should need it. That's only covered by Part A if you have been an inpatient for three days. So if it's less than three days, or if you weren't admitted, you're not eligible for that skilled nursing facility care at Part A's expense. So if there's any doubt in your mind, ask, am I being admitted? Am I an inpatient? Sometimes the clerk or the doctor or whoever will use the phrase, we're going to admit you for observation. <coughs> you want to know, am I being admitted as an inpatient? That's a critical, critical yeah. distinction because it decides whether you do or don't have to pay the Part A deductible, whether you'll be billed under Part B, and whether you're eligible for skilled nursing facility care if you should need it. Okay, the second half of this table on page two gives you the figures for Part D. That's the drug coverage. This year, the maximum deductible in a Medicare drug plan is $310. Next year, it will be $320. Plans are allowed to charge up to those amounts. Some plans don't have any deductible, and some have an intermediate amount, like $200 or $250. If they don't have a deductible, you know they're making the money somewhere. Maybe it's a higher premium. Maybe it's higher co-payments. One way or another, they're going to get their money. But it all figures into the equation of what will your total cost over the course of the year be. The donut hole is a very unpopular part of Medicare Part D. When D began in 2006, actually the legislation was passed in 2003, Congress had a budget to work with and they wanted to be sure that they were very generous to people with very high drug costs. Also generous to people with very low incomes. Also they wanted to be sure that everybody would get some benefits so that people would join. But they also had to stay within a budget and something had to give. They couldn't accomplish all of those things within the amount of money that they wanted to use. And what gave was the middle what's called the donut hole. The official name for the donut hole is the coverage gap, but it's popularly known as the donut hole because it's a perfect metaphor. It's the part in the middle where there's nothing there. Because when Medicare D began, 
once you got to the donut hole, once you had used a certain amount of drugs, the benefit stopped. There was nothing there, but you still had to keep paying the premium. It was not a popular feature. And then you kept on paying the premium until you got out of the donut hole, but very few people did. So many people would either stop taking their drugs or they would skip doses or they'd cut their pills in half, all kinds of things to try to economize to avoid the donut hole or to um, save some money once they were in the dreaded donut hole. So as part of the Affordable Care Act, the legislation that created what's called Obamacare, Congress included a provision to start phasing out the donut hole. By 2020, another just over five years from now, the donut hole will be completely gone. But they're phasing it out. It begins next year when you reach $2,960 worth of drugs. Now that's not your share of the cost, that's the total cost. So for instance, if you took $200 worth of drugs every month, that would be $2,400 a year, you would not reach the start of the donut hole, it's not an issue for you. But if you took $300 worth of drugs, a total of $3,600 worth over the course of the year, you would get in the donut hole probably about October. So that would be an issue for you. But they are phasing it out, it's not gone yet, but it's getting better every year. And the donut hole lasts until the total cost of your drugs is about $6,680 next year. So it's not gone, but it's getting better. And those are the figures that you need to, or that will be included in the calculation of what is your best plan. The next handout in your packet, another horizontal page that looks like this, and it's a table of every drug plan offered in Illinois this year and next year. It's headlined Medicare Prescription Drug Plans Offered in Illinois 2014 and 2015. There are more than 30 plans next year as well as this year. None of them is the best. There is no one that you can say this is clearly the Cadillac of plans. It all depends on what drugs you take. Every plan is free to set its own premium it's deductible up to that maximum next year of $320. It can set its co-payments for all of the drugs. It gets to decide which drugs to cover and which drugs not to cover. It gets to decide how to classify those drugs as a preferred generic, a non-preferred generic, a preferred name brand, a non-preferred name brand, or a specialty drug. That is a huge mass of data times more than 30 plans. So how do you choose? You don't just go eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Don't assume that your current plan, whatever it is, is your best choice for next year. If you had to do the calculation on your own with all 30 plans, all with these various factors that go into the equation, there isn't enough scratch paper in the world if you had to do this on your own, even if you had the data and you don't have the data. So what's the answer? The Medicare website, which is Medicare.gov, has a tool called the Plan Finder. And you enter the list of all of your drugs and the dosage and you give them your zip code. You don't have to give them your name, just your zip code so they know what state you're in. And the computer will do the calculation for you and identify the plan that will be the least expensive for you for those drugs. And there's a sample of a plan finder, the very last thing in your packet. This is a plan finder that I ran for somebody this season. He had called and told me what plan he was in. It's the very last thing in your packet. The very last on the bottom, on the bottom of your paper clipped packet. Every plan finder has this identical format so that it's easy to compare. And 
This one is for Humana Walmart, which happened to be this man's least expensive choice. And it tells you that on a rating of one to five stars, this plan <coughs> next year is rated at four stars, well above average. Average is three. It tells you that the premium is $15.70 a month. The deductible is the maximum, $320. And then just a little below that, it says, estimate of what you will pay for drug plan premium and drug costs. Are you all with me? Then it says, if he goes to Walmart, $368 is his total for the year. That's the sum of the premium and all the co-payments. The premium times 12 plus all the co-payments. If he went to Walgreens, look at the difference. It would be $1,178, three times as much. Well, how can that be? Well, as you can guess, the name of the plan is Humana Walmart. They made a deal with Walmart to get a very good price for their enrollees. If he used mail order, it would be even cheaper than if, than if he went to the Walmart pharmacy. It's only $188 over the course of the year. On the next page of this same handout, it, you see the list of all of this man's drugs. Clonidine, furosemide, chlorcon, metformin, metoprolol, and tamsulosin, and the dosage. And it tells you what the full cost of each one of those drugs is, if you were paying the full price in this plan, how often he gets it refilled. In most cases, it's every month what it costs until he has met the deductible, because this plan gives you a cheaper price for generics before you meet the deductible, what it will cost while he's in the initial coverage level, what it costs in the coverage gap, which is the official name of the donut hole, and what it costs if he got to the catastrophic coverage stage. Actually, this man's total drugs are not enough to get him to the donut hole as far as we can foresee now. These are all the drugs he takes routinely, day in and day out. But who knows what other drug he might need next year, either on a continuing basis for maintenance, or he might get pneumonia and need a lot of expensive antibiotics. So that would change the calculation. But this is the calculation for the drugs that we know he's going to take next year. And if you do the arithmetic, it comes out to that figure of the $368 over the course of the year. That's the least expensive plan for this man. But if he had stayed in the plan that he's in this year, this is not on your paper, but I just wrote myself a note. He's currently in the First Health Part D Value Plus. If he had stayed in that plan, his current plan for next year, his total cost would be $647. So by switching to the Humana Walmart, instead of $647, he pays $368. So he saves about $300. Yes. That's a question. Yes. On the top here, it's got a zip code, 60914. Right. Is that the price for that zip code? No. The, you just enter the zip code so the computer knows you're in Illinois. Oh, okay. It doesn't tell you what plans are offered in Indiana. No, okay. it really doesn't. You could enter any zip code as long as it's in the state. Okay. The plan doesn't know who's, excuse me, the computer and Medicare don't know whose plan finder this is. In the top right corner of page one, it gives the zip code, it gives the password date, which is the date I did this plan finder, and it gives a 10-digit <coughs> drug ID list. So if he called me tomorrow and said, I forgot, I'm also taking such and such, could you add that to the list? I could go back and retrieve the list, add the new drug, and it would recalculate it and give me the new results. I don't have to do it over again. But Medicare doesn't know whose list this is. That man and I are the only two people who know. And I don't even remember his name at the moment. <laughs> I have it written down. So. This is, sure. Are you at all skeptical of that $1,178 item? 
total for Walgreens. These are all uh, generics. We uh -huh. know that. Uh -huh. And we know that generics are anywhere from mm -hmm. three to whatever, 25 bucks or something. You can't, I can't get to 11.78. Hey, well, I could print out this, the prices that are offered on, listed on page two are if you went to Walmart. Mm -hmm. I could print it out a second time using the Walgreens figures and it would add up to that amount. Anybody who would sign up to do that, knowing the price difference, mm -hmm. is not very careful of their money. The problem is many people don't realize how prices vary from one plan to another and one pharmacy to another. Mm -hmm. In another plan, Walgreens might be the preferred pharmacy and Walmart is not. Sometimes somebody will say, I don't want to go to Walmart, I don't like it, or it's not convenient to get there, it's 20 miles away. So I say, well, what pharmacy do you want? And then we look for a plan that gives them a good price at that pharmacy. It's kind of like the sticker price on a car. Nobody pays it, but that's your starting point. I understand your skepticism, but if in fact you joined this plan and got these drugs at Walgreens, that is what you would pay, but I hope you don't do it. <laughs> and does it make any difference if all pharmacies have the same drugs? I mean, the manufacturers? It isn't whether the pharmacy has the same drugs, it's whether the plan covers them. Well, but if you take generic drugs, just about every plan covers just about every drug. There's probably an exception in there somewhere, but you can be pretty sure that they do. If you get into more expensive and more specialized and particularly name brand drugs, then sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. If they don't cover it, if a particular plan doesn't cover it, the plan finder will tell you that. It's not in our formulary. Maybe the generic version of it is in their formulary, but the name brand isn't. So when you do the plan finder, it's very important if you take the generic, enter the generic name. If you take the name brand, enter the name brand name. If you enter the name brand and a generic is available, it will tell you that and say, would you rather we do the calculation with the generic? And you can s say yes, and it will make the switch. But it's important that you're conscious of that and, and identify the drugs that you actually take. Farther down on the bottom of page two, there's another list of the same drugs, and it tells you which ones are tier one, preferred generic, page two of the plan finder. I'm sorry. It tells you whether it's a preferred generic or a non-preferred generic. That makes a difference in the amount of your copayment. And it also tells you whether any of those drugs have any restrictions on them. The restrictions include the requirement for prior authorization, particularly for um, expensive drugs and for drugs that are medically um, more likely to cause problems. I'm not saying they're not needed, but caution is needed. The plan can require that your doctor document that yes, indeed, you do need this specific drug. So it's a one time a year thing. The doctor fills out the form and says, yes, Mrs. Smith really needs this. Another uh, usage restriction is quantity limits. The plan will only cover a certain number of pills or a certain number of bottles of drops or whatever a month. That's, u that's usually for your own health. Did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, the other thing about uh, drug interference with each other. That's true. The pharmacist usually is more aware of this than your doctor. <laughs> That is frequently true, especially because you might be taking drugs from more than one doctor. I don't get one. So that's another good point. And finally, the third restriction is step therapy requirements. That's not imposed too often, but when it is, it can be a real hassle. Step therapy means the drug that your doctor prescribed is in the formulary. The plan covers it, but before they will authorize it for you, you have to take usually a less expensive generic, and if that doesn't solve the problem or it causes unacceptable side effects, then maybe you have to take the preferred name brand. 
And then if that doesn't work, then they'll cover the drug that was originally prescribed. So other things being equal, you'd rather avoid those requirements. Did you? What's the difference between preferred and non-preferred? Every plan can decide for every drug that they cover whether they're going to consider it preferred or non-preferred. And the difference it makes to you is what your copayment will be. In general, tier one is preferred generic, tier two is non-preferred generic, usually with a higher copayment, maybe just a little bit higher, but a little. Tier three is a preferred name brand, tier four is a non-preferred name brand, tier five is a specialty drug. So it's very important, not just that they cover the drug, but how they classify it. And a drug that is, in fact, a generic could be a tier three or a tier four. I just said tier three is preferred name brand, but plans can decide whether they want to put it in tier two or tier three. So again, don't assume. Check to see how they classify every drug. And one plan might say it's a preferred, and another plan says it's non-preferred. Each plan gets to make that classification itself. So it's a huge mass of detail. Yes. Question over Yes. Why do they make it so complicated? <laughs> <laughs> the plans are in business to make money. And we're glad that they are, because we'd be up a creek without them. But they may not want to be too transparent. And they are hoping that once they get you enrolled, you will just stay there forever. That you won't do this every year. You'll stay with them even though it may not be the least expensive plan. The Kaiser Family Foundation is a very highly respected uh, medical think tank, you might call it based in California, and they do all kinds of research and advocacy uh, on health care issues. And they recently did a study of Medicare enrollees all over the country with focus groups and questionnaires and so on to determine how did people choose what drug plan to join initially, and then how did they decide every year whether to stay with that plan or to switch. And the answers were very revealing, but very discouraging, because very, very few people used the plan finder. The plan finder is the only absolutely objective, absolutely accurate, absolutely comprehensive source of information. Medicare puts the information out, so you know it's accurate, you know it's honest. They update it every year and throughout the year if that should be necessary. It covers all the plans. Medicare doesn't care. They're not trying to steer you to one plan or another. So if people didn't use the plan finder, what did they do? Well, some of them just said, I have my supplemental insurance from such and such a company. I'll join their drug plan. It's probably a fine drug plan, but it's not necessarily the least expensive. Sometimes they ask their insurance broker, what do you recommend? Or they ask the pharmacist, what do you recommend? The insurance broker may sell insurance from certain companies, but not all. So that broker is not completely objective. It's like if I went into a Ford dealer and said, what would be the best car for my needs? you can be pretty sure that the answer would be a Ford. <laughs> but if I went to the Chevy dealer and asked the same question, you can be pretty sure that the answer will be a Chevy. Well, the same thing if I go to the insurance broker who represents three companies, his recommendation is going to be one of those three. If I go to a pharmacist and ask, it's likely to be one of the plans in which his pharmacy is a preferred plan. So that's better than nothing, but it's not looking at all the choices. Furthermore, once people made their initial selection way back, either in 2006 or whenever they joined for Part D, their feeling was, 
it was so horrible, it was so difficult to make a decision, I'm never doing that again, I'm just going to stick with the plan that I'm in. That's what the plans are counting on. That once they've got you, you'll stay there, even though the premiums may go up, the deductible may go up, the uh, classification of their drugs may go up from a tier two to a tier three. They're hoping that you're not going to evaluate all your choices. But it's your health and it's your money. This man for whom I did this plan finder saved about $300 a year by switching. So maybe you would save a lot, maybe you would save a very modest amount and decide it's not worth it. Maybe you would discover that whatever plan you're in now is your best choice, in which case you don't have to do anything and you will know that you've got the cheapest plan for you for 2015. The cheapest plan for you, the one that covers your drugs at the lowest cost and with the least hassle, is not necessarily the best choice for your spouse, for your sister, for your next door neighbor. It's your best choice. It's as though I said, these prescriptions in my glasses are just wonderful and you should have them too. No, you need your prescription, you need your prescription. This is only good for me, for my unique needs. So don't assume that whatever plan you're in is your best choice for next year. Okay, working on our way through, thank you, through this stack. We're, done with this group. We're down to the page that says Medicare Part D in 2014 and 2015. And this really pretty much tells you what I've just already said. There are uh, Medicare Part D in 2014 and 2015 says there will be 34 different plans next year to choose from. The maximum deductible is 320. Talks about the donut hole, which we covered. While you're in the donut hole, if you get to that point, <coughs> if you have more than $2,960 worth of drugs, you will pay 45% of the total cost of the drugs for name brands and 65% of the total cost of generics. And next year, in 2016, you'll pay a smaller percentage, and in 2017, smaller still, and so on, until we get to 2020. And at that point, you will be paying 25% of the cost of your drugs, either generic or name brand, and that's approximately what you pay before you get to the donut hole. In other words, the donut hole will be phased out, and that is provided under the Affordable Care Act. I explained this to a man, this was several years ago, and I would say he was in his late 80s then. And he listened very patiently to my explanation, and then he said, honey, I don't care what they're going to do in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be here in 2020. <laughs> but that's true, you never know. So um, another factor I wanted to mention is that drugs, Sooner or later, name brand drugs become generics. In general, the patent on a name brand drug is 20 years. After that, generic manufacturers can enter the market. When there's only one generic manufacturer, it really d usually doesn't do much to lower the price. But when there are two or three and you've got some competition, then the price can come down drastically. So I gave a list in here of what patents expired this year and what patents will expire next year. So if you take one of those drugs, you can look forward to some savings. It doesn't always happen immediately. If the patent expires today, the generic is not going to be on the market tomorrow. It, it takes a while, but eventually it will happen. So that can be a source of real savings. Um, I also mentioned about using preferred pharmacies. Mail order is another topic. In the case of this man with the Humana Walmart plan, if he had gone to the Humana pharmacy, excuse me, the Walmart pharmacy, he would pay over the course of the year about $368. If he used the mail order plan that that plan offers, his total for the year for the exact same drugs, only $188. So he saves about half. 
Sometimes mail order saves a lot. Sometimes it saves a little. Sometimes it doesn't save you anything. It's even more expensive. So again, it varies from plan to plan and depending on what drugs you take. But it is something that you should look at. Usually if you use mail order, you get a 90-day supply rather than a 30-day supply. If you use mail order and then you get a new prescription that you need right away, such as an antibiotic, for that you would go to a retail pharmacy. But if you're taking maintenance drugs where a 90-day supply is a convenience, this can be a real savings, but sometimes it isn't. You just have to do the plan finder. What yes. Is the paper that you said showed you where drugs are going to generic. It's on the page marked Medicare Part D in 2014 and 2015. Oh, right uh, about the fifth or sixth bullet point down. Okay. Says check whether any name brand you take has become available as a generic. That's where that list is. Okay. okay. Then the next page is notes on Medicare prescription drug plans in Illinois in 2015. And this tells you who is having substantial changes in their premium or their deductible. The maximum deductible is currently 310 and next year it will be 320. So many, many plans are having just that $10 increase. But this tells you which ones are having more than a $10 increase. For instance, the first bullet point under deductibles is that the WellCare Classic plan is going from zero this year to 320 next year. That would be a rude awakening if in January you went to the pharmacy and the answer is you haven't met your deductible yet and you're not going to meet it for months. It will be taken into consideration in the plan finder, but you should be aware of it. And the other three are noted also. Then it tells you which ones are having a substantial increase in or reduction in the premium. There are a couple that are going down, three I think, and six or seven that are going up. So that is another concern. Then it tells you which plans are being discontinued. There are eight plans offered in Illinois this year that will not be offered next year. So if you're in one of those plans in particular, you can't stay there, obviously. For several of them, for instance, the first one under discontinued plans is Cigna HealthSpring RX Reg 17. And that is being discontinued, and it has 51,000 people in it in Illinois. So those 51,000 people will have to make a change. But if they don't initiate a change, if they don't take the initiative and say, this is what I want, they will automatically be switched to another plan offered by the same company, Cigna HealthSpring RX Secure. Maybe it's a good choice, maybe it's not. And for all those others, it tells you, if you don't make a change on your own, this is what you will be automatically switched to. But you can override that by making a choice and either calling the plan you want or calling Medicare. Either way, or you can enroll online, and that will override this automatic switch. And then there are four new plans offered in Illinois uh, for the first time in 2015. The next handout is tips on using the plan finder, and that's pretty much what I already told you, but read it over because it's a lot of detail. Then go on to the next horizontal page, which is about extra help. I mentioned that when Congress created Part D, they wanted to be very generous to people with very low incomes, people who didn't qualify for Medicaid but who still would predictably have a hard time covering their drug costs. And that program is known as Extra Help, also known as the Low Income Subsidy. If you get Medicaid, in addition to Medicare, if you get both, or if you get supplemental security income, not social security, but supplemental security, or if you're in the Medicare savings program, those three categories of people automatically get extra help. They don't have to apply for it. But if you're not in one of those categories, you may be eligible if you meet the income and asset limits, and that's in the lower half of the page. 
For a single person, the income limit to be eligible for extra help is $1,313 a month or $1,774 a couple. And there's also an asset limit. People frequently find this confusing. Income is the money that you're getting every month from Social Security, pensions, interests, dividends, whatever. Assets are the various forms of wealth that you already have. For this purpose, we're not counting the value of your home, your car, your personal property, and your household goods. We're counting what you have in the bank, in stocks and bonds, in certificates of deposit, that kind of more liquid wealth that you could tap. So the asset limit for a single person is 8,660. For a couple, it's 13,750. If you meet the income and the asset limits both, you should definitely apply for extra help and you do the application through the Social Security Administration, not through Medicare. You can do it online and it's pretty painless. And if you qualify, you get very, very generous coverage, a subsidy for the premium of your plan and for the co-payments. So your out-of-pocket expense will be very, very small. An unfortunate thing is that many people who qualify for extra help don't know about it and never apply. If they're in those three categories, they get it automatically. But if they're not, and they only get it if they apply, they're missing the boat because they never do the application. That's for their medication that they would get. Right, this is for Part D only. So probably somebody that you know qualifies and doesn't know about it. So talk it up. I wish I could say I'd pay a commission for everybody that you could find who's eligible for extra help, but you'll feel terrific if you're... You can do that through the Social Security? Right, you can go online and do it or you can call the Social Security Administration, or you can go to all these sources of assistance on page one. There's help available everywhere. The next page explains in more detail than you probably want to know about that star rating system. On a one to five scale, there is no plan in Illinois that's five stars. But we're getting closer. We've got several four and four and a half. Three out of, on a scale of five, three stars is average. But I'm beginning to think this is like Lake Wobegon. You know Garrison Keillor's town of Lake Wobegon? All the children are above average. Well, that's mathematically impossible. But the same thing is true here because there's only one plan out of 34 that's below average. How can this be? <laughs> but we're glad that the plans are improving. They're all cleaning up their act and we're getting smarter as we go. So this g explains how they arrive at what those star ratings are. Finally, the page about Part B, prevention and wellness benefits. This is not Part D, this is Part B. One of the benefits of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, is that it increased the benefits available to Medicare participants under Part B for prevention and wellness. A lot of early detection and um, treatments for diseases on the theory that the ounce of prevention is worth the pound of cure, is worth far more than the pound of cure. We'd much rather catch a disease while it's still in the early treatable stage than have it progress to, to an advanced stage when it's much more life-threatening, it's more painful and debilitating, it's more expensive, and the odds of success go down. So there's a long list of benefits that are, in effect, free to you. They are not subject to the Part B deductible, and they are not subject to Part B co-payments. They're free to you. So if the doctor says you need a colonoscopy, you can't use the excuse of expense to avoid doing it. It's free, so you gotta do it. And finally, the last page in there is about the relationship of Medicare and the Affordable Care Act. Right now, in addition to the enrollment period for Medicare Part D and for Medicare Advantage, they're also having the enrollment period for younger people who are not on Medicare, who are in plans offered through the Affordable Care Act, 
and this is their opportunity to switch plans if they want to or to sign up if they didn't at this time last year. Yes? Is the range to sign up for that the same? It has to be no, no, seven. no, it's less. It's less. What's the for Medicare, it's October 15th, last week, to December 7th, and any change made during that time will take effect the 1st of January. I think for the Affordable Care Act, it's November 15th, and I'm not sure what the end, end date is. But don't concern yourself with it because it doesn't apply to you. The purpose of coverage under the Affordable Care Act, that's for people who didn't have comprehensive health insurance. If you're on Medicare, you already have comprehensive health insurance. You don't need an Affordable Care Act plan. If somebody tries to sell you one or talk you into it, either they are completely misinformed or more likely they are con artists because you don't need it and by law you cannot sign up for an Affordable Care Act plan. You don't need it. Why would you, why would you want to do that? The effects of the Affordable Care Act on Medicare are, as we mentioned, it is phasing out the Part D donut hole. That's a big advantage to you. It extends the life of the Medicare Part A trust fund, the pool into which all those payroll taxes go. It increases resources that fight fraud and abuse in Medicare. This is a serious problem. There is so much money involved in Medicare for 60 million people that criminals are irresistibly drawn to it. And they're always trying to figure out what scam can I organize, what angle can I exploit to rip people off. So the Affordable Care Act increased the resources to, um, to fight that. It provides um, extra incentives for doctors and hospitals to prov provide better quality care and, um, and to enable them to do so. For instance, it gave doctors and medical practices funds to help pay for um, electronic medical record keeping which reduces errors and makes it possible for doctors to share records and so on. It's not perfect, we've got a long way to go, but we're on the way, and that's partly because of the Affordable Care Act. And finally, one of the biggest benefits to Medicare is kind of an indirect thing. Before the Affordable Care Act began last year at this time, there were millions of people who didn't have any health insurance because they couldn't afford it or because they had some health condition that excluded them. No insurer would take them because they were a bad risk. We'll never get to 100% insurance coverage, but the Affordable Care Act has greatly reduced that. It's made it possible, everybody has access to insurance, and people with incomes up to four times the poverty level are eligible for a subsidy. Therefore, there aren't going to be the millions of people coming into Medicare who eventually qualify when they reach age 65 who haven't had any insurance, who haven't seen a doctor in ages, who have been living on prayer and vitamin pills for years. I believe in prayer and I believe in vitamin pills, but neither one is a substitute for comprehensive health care. And so by providing that for younger people, it's also helping Medicare because those younger people are sooner or later going to be in Medicare and they'll be a lot healthier when they get there. So that is my spiel and I'm sure I have covered some things faster than you wanted. If you have a general question I can answer that. If you want to talk to me individually you can do so. Oh, I left out the most important thing because we glossed over page one all these phone numbers and websites. I gave the Medicare and the Social Security phone numbers and websites. Then in the middle third of the page, I listed what's called the Case Coordination Unit. My agency serves eight counties, including Will County, and I listed Senior Services Center of Will County is what's called the Case Coordination Unit for the entire county. So if you have any questions about services for the elderly or I think my next door neighbor is really in trouble, that's the place to call. And then I listed SHIP sites in Will County. SHIP is the Senior Health Insurance Program. It used to be in the State Department of Insurance and last year they moved it to the Department on Aging. 
But as you can tell from the name, the specialty of that program is helping seniors with problems related to their health insurance, straightening out dilemmas and making good decisions. SHIP relies on well-trained volunteers who just love to get into this kind of thing and help you figure out the answer to your question and to help you save money. So there are three SHIP sites here in Will County. One is at um, the Senior Services Center. One is at uh, Provena St. Joseph's, present St. Joseph's I should call it. And one is the Will Grundy Center for Independent Living. And all three of those have people who are trained by SHIP and who have access to many more resources than the average person. And they're all ready to help you, particularly now with a plan finder or other questions related to the enrollment period or anything throughout the year that concerns Medicare or related topics. So there's a lot of help available to you. And I just wish that everybody would take advantage of it because I hate to have people being shortchanged because they didn't know that help was available. So that is my spiel. If you have general questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And if you have personal questions, I can stick around as long as you like. Mm -hmm.